I've, I've always been a big fan of Benedict. Um, Benedict received his PhD from Toulouse University in 2015, uh, spent some time uh, in New York working together with, uh, with uh, Charlie Schroeder and uh, Peter Lakatosch. May he rest in peace. Um, and uh, afterwards, you moved over to Cambridge, working with Matt Davis. And then finally, you are a, a professor in Toulouse, in France. And you have a permanent position there, and that's great. Um, so um, Benedict is, for me, one of the people who have really uh, provided some of the most fundamental evidence for, well, the psychological and neural reality of rhythmic entrainment to, uh, to uh, auditory stimuli. Yeah, and he studied that with experiments that have rhythm built in, um, but he also has studied that uh, using uh, neurostimulation techniques, so causal intervention techniques. And I think that's fascinating, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's research that we can really rely on when we are coming up with uh, new experiments, essentially. So that's, thank you for, for doing that, for giving some, some hard evidence to, to, uh, to this field. Um, Benedict and I, I don't know when we actually met. It must have been at SNL in Helsinki, no, earlier. Earlier. Earlier, yeah. Um, but at SNL in Helsinki, I really became, I think, the, the, the major fan. And now I want to tell this anecdote that you don't know about yet, but I will tell it because Benedict Zwiffel at the SNL in Helsinki, the lecture hall designed by Alva Alto um, in front of 500 people, uh, wrapped a poster blitz, an entire poster blitz. So he was giving a presentation on rhythmic entrainment. And what does he do? He speaks in a rhythm and he rhymes a whole poster, poster blitz. And that was, that was killing. I've never seen anything like that. So that's kind of, I will always be your fan for scientific reasons and for just having that, that attitude in that room that day. So thank you, Benedict, for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you so much, Lars. Thank you for the invitation and also for the coolest introduction I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I cannot promise I will wrap this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so today, uh, as you can see, I will talk about causality in, in speech processing, and especially causality of brain rhythms. And uh, I won't give a, a long introduction about brain rhythms because I think everyone is familiar uh, with them. But um, what do they do? In principle, I, I think that their role can be nicely illustrated by the finding that they lead to rhythms in perception. So if we if we present an, a target, a visual target that is unpredictable, then the detection of this target depends on the phase of the oscillation. But does that mean that the oscillations causally modulate perception? And for this, we need to define causality. And I have selected three different criteria for uh, for causality for you. The first is temporality. Uh, for something to be causal, the cause factor needs to precede the outcome. This is, a, this is a hard criterion. If there's no temporality, there's no causality. This is the case here because the phase of the oscillation precedes perception. And there's specificity. There shouldn't be any other explanation for what we observe, other than the causal factor in question. Uh, in theory, it, there could be a process that modulates phase and perception at the same time, but I think uh, here we are quite close to specificity. Let's experiment. If we alter the cause, then this should alter the effect. This is not the case here, not because altering the cause did not alter the effect, but because the cause was not altered. So you, you might say um, that's not strictly necessary because here we have natural fluctuations in phase anyway. But there might be scenarios where this is important. For instance, we know that an unpredictable auditory target does not 
uh, the detection does not depend on the phase of oscillations. So it could be in this case that we need to actually induce oscillations in the auditory system to test their, their causal role for perception. How can we induce oscillations? As you all know, entrainment is an, a nice way to do that. So the, the idea behind entrainment is that we have, an, we have an oscillation in the brain here in red, and then we present a, a rhythmic or kind of rhythmic stimulus such as speech in, in black here. And then the oscillation is flexible enough to align, change its frequency and align its phase to, to this stimulus. So imagine that now we entrain the oscillation and we find that stimulus detection depends on the phase of the entrained oscillation. Does it mean that the oscillation is causally relevant for perception? Temporality, yes, because first we change the phase and then we affect perception. Experiment, yes, because we experimentally change the oscillation. Specificity, no, because there are all kinds of other explanations that could lead to the effect. For instance, if we present a target here, uh, it might be easier to detect because there's uh, there's less masking as compared to when we present a, a target here. So no specificity. Um, what has also been shown is that uh, when our entrainment, when our tracking changes and fails at a certain moment in time, then our speech intelligibility is uh, reduced. Does that mean that entrainment is costly relevant for speech perception? Temporality, yes. Specificity, no, because it could just be that it's uh, there are changes in attention over time that change entrainment and speech perception. So we don't know if it's really uh, entrainment that causes the changes in speech perception. Experiment also no, because here there's natural fluctuations in entrainment. There are other uh, studies like this one by Jonathan Peel and colleagues. Here they use the uh, noise recording to change the intelligibility of, of speech. Noise recording is interesting, it's interesting because it allows us to change the intelligibility without changing the broadband envelope of, of the stimulus. And here, the more channels we use, the more intelligible it is. So 16, 16 channel speech is highly intelligible. One channel speech uh, only sounds like noise. And I will show you examples later. So what they found is that entrainment is reduced when they make speech unintelligible. Does that mean that entrainment causally modulates speech perception? No, because there's no temporality to start with, to begin with. Uh, there is temporality, but in the opposite way. What we can conclude here is that speech intelligibility causally, chain, causally modulates entrainment. But what we want to know, does entrainment causally modulate speech perception? We want to know the opposite. So we and others in, in recent years have used transcranial alternating current stimulation or TACS to, uh, to answer that question for causality. So how, how does that work? The idea is that uh, without TACS, we have uh, uh, spikes or neural firing here called MUA that follows the oscillation here called EF. Hey. Um, I'm in a meeting, but yes. No, I'm just listening so you can wait. Okay. Um, so the, uh, in a natural scenario, the spikes follow the, the, the phase of the oscillation. And when we, the idea is that when we apply TSS, when we apply alternating current, then the firing, the, the oscillation follows the alternating current. And that's why the firing follows also the, the current. So the firing follows the current as it would normally follow the, the oscillations. Um, so that's... Uh, that's in vitro data, but it also works transcranially. So here's a, a study where they applied uh, alternating current uh, transcranially and this in an animal model and the spikes followed, as you can see, the phase of the, of the current. So this principle is the, the basis for, for several studies that we run. The idea is we apply TACS and then oscillations follow the, the alternating current which means that if entrainment is causally relevant for speech perception, there should be a best TACS phase for speech perception and a worst, the opposite phase uh, for speech perception. And I'll show you, show you some details in the following. In one study, we combined TACS with fMRI. Here, um, 
this, this follows exactly the idea that I just described. We had uh, in each trial, we presented rhythmic speech, and that speech was either unintelligible or intelligible using noise recording, and it was presented at one particular TACS phase in each trial. And I'll show you how this sounds like. Six, six, pink, eight, down. Pick two, blue, horse up. Um, okay, so what did we expect? If entrainment causally modulates neural responses to speech, there should be one phase relation between TSS and speech that leads to a relatively strong both response to that speech measured, measured with fMRI. And there should be the opposite phase relation that leads to a relatively weak uh, neural response and intermediate phase relations in between. So we expected a sinusoidal modulation of the neural response by TACS. And we didn't expect that for a sham condition. So here we stimulated only unilateral uh, using a configuration shown. And I'll show you uh, immediately the, the results without uh, explaining too much of how we obtained them. I will, I will tell you that later. So what you see here, the bars is the magnitude of the phasic modulation of the speech processing induced by TACS. And what we found is there is such a phasic modulation but only in the stimulation condition, not in the sham, and only for intelligible speech. We can also look at the, the actual bold response as a function of TACS. Here we have the, the very common issue in the field of TACS that not everyone has the same TACS phase that leads to the, the, the best speech perception or the strongest neural response. So that means we cannot just average across subjects. One uh, way to fix this is to align the best or the, the best TACS phase for each subject at a certain phase bin, here's zero. That means that this is trivially a maximum. We cannot analyze it, but we can look, uh, we cannot include it in the analysis, but we can look at the rest of the, of the data. And what you see here is that there are certain phase relations where the both response in the stimulation condition here in black is reduced as compared to the shell, which means that the phase effect we saw uh, was translated as a suppressive effect for the both response. Anyway, what this means is that entrainment seems to have a, a causal influence on the neural responses to, to intelligible speech. So we ran a, a follow-up study where we actually tested speech perception. And that had, was a very similar design. Again, uh, speech was presented, rhythmic speech was presented at a different phase of TACS each trial. And now participants had to click on images that corresponded to words they have heard. And again, we aligned the performance at a certain, certain phase bin. Here we align at the maximum, which means that this will be a maximum, but we can look at the, the rest of the phase bins. If there's an, a phasic effect, then the green bin should be higher than the blue, so V1 should be positive. If we align at the minimal performance, which we can also do, then the yellow should be lower than the orange, should. so D, D2 should also be, be positive, should be negative. So. so what we found here, is that there's no phase modulation if we stimulate using this configuration here that we also used in the MRI experiment. However, we also had a, another condition where we stimulated bilaterally and with ring electrodes, which are supposed to increase the focality of the, of the stimulation. And there we found exactly what we would expect from a phase modulation of speech perception. Um, and that translated into a change in speech perception accuracy of about 8%. What we can also see here by comparing the, the speech perception accuracy with sham, zero would be, uh, so this is expressed relative to sham, which means that zero, uh, in, for zero, it would be zero if sham and stim are, are the same. What we see here is that there's a disruption of speech perception in some phase bins, but no enhancement. So here again, we found that TACS has a disruptive effect, but not an enhancement. So now I'm coming back to the original question. Does that show us that entrainment is causally 
relevant for speech perception. Temporality we have, experiment we also have, specific, specificity not quite, because we shouldn't forget that there are some phases, the peak and the trough, where we inject a lot of current. There are other phases, like the, the zero crossing, where no current is injected, which means that the phase effect we see could again just reflect the periodicity of the current. It doesn't have to be an intrinsically rhythmic neural response uh, that we, we change. So how can we solve all of this? How can we find uh, causality? Um, so the, the principal issue seems to be that we, we measure neural responses or perception during a rhythmic stimulus, where we have all kinds of different explanations for the effect of masking uh, or uh, the periodicity of the, the stimulus itself that changes our responses. So how can we solve this? We can just measure the new response, not during the stimulus, but after the stimulus. Yeah, we assume that the oscillation should continue a little, to swing a little bit, like a, a swing that we push and it change, uh, uh, keeps swinging when we stop pushing it. But the many alternative explanations should not be present anymore because there is no stimulus. So this rhythmic response that outlasts the rhythmic stimulus, we call rhythmic entrainment echoes, um, which bring us much closer to specificity because uh, it, the rhythmic response that we see here can only be explained by, the, by a true brain oscillation that continues to, to be present when we stop the, the stimulus. And I'll show you now some studies where we uh, try to find these rhythmic entrainment echoes. The first is an MEG study where we again used rhythmic speech. Uh, the speech was presented either at three hertz or at two hertz, and we again used intelligible and unintelligible speech. So I'll, I'll zoom into one sequence here, where the idea is that during the sound, we have all kinds of neural processes going on, for example, evoked responses that only look like a, a true endogenous oscillation. But when we stop the stimulus, then the oscillation should continue, but the evoked responses should stop because there's no stimulus. So this is a rhythmic entrainment echo that I was talking about. We quantified this uh, rhythmic brain response using intertrial coherence, or ITC. ITC is high at a certain frequency if there's a consistent brain response at that frequency. Here you, you can see the ITC at two hertz. So here you can see the, the ITC during the two hertz stimulus here, during the three hertz stimulus. And what you can see is that a two hertz stimulus evokes uh, a nice two hertz response. A three hertz stimulus evokes a nice three hertz response. But at zero is where the stimulus stops. So now we wanted to, to know what's going on here in this silent period immediately after the, after the stimulus. So we quantified something that we call rate-specific response, or RSR, where we basically contrasted the ITC at 2 hertz during 2 hertz stimulation and the ITC at 2 hertz during 3 hertz stimulation and vice versa for, for 3 hertz. So the, the point to remember here is that the RSR is larger than zero if there's a rhythmic response that is specific for the stimulus rate. We define two windows of interest, the first entrained during the sound, and the second sustained after, after the sound. So to, to, remind, to remind you, zero is where the, stim, where the first omission happened. And I'll show you results for these two uh, windows of interest. So during the, during the sound, the RSR is clearly above zero uh, for all conditions. This is not a big surprise because we have the stimulus, which, and it will drive our rhythmic response. We can also contrast conditions and we see an advantage for intelligible speech. And when we only look at the intelligible conditions, then we can see uh, an auditory response. Uh, uh, and that's stronger for intelligible speech, similar to the study by Peel that I showed before. So here we have strong rate specific responses and they are increased during intelligible speech. But now what is more interesting is what happens in the silent period. We see an RSR that is close to zero. It might be uh, slightly above zero in some conditions, but this is not, uh, the results are not very clear on the sensor average. 
level, but they be become clearer when we look at individual sensors of the MEG. When we contrast conditions, we again see an advantage for intelligible speech that produces a stronger uh, sustained rhythmic response. And if we only look at these intelligible conditions, we see a response that is uh, reliably stronger with an SNR, RSR that is reliably above zero. And this is localized to these parameter sensors here. So we, we find the rhythmic entrainment echo, but only after intelligible speech, not after noise. We can also look at that in detail. We selected, we selected some, some sensors to at first for the sensors that responded strongly during the sound, and then sensors that responded strongly after the sound. And what here we can we can plot the, the effect in time. And what we can see, yeah, there are a few uh, things I want to uh, I want to, to highlight. First, the sensors that are responsive during the silent bit are also responsive during the sound, but to a smaller degree. Also, the sustained response um, is present almost throughout the, the silent period. There's no outlier that has driven the, the, the effect. Participants also had a task. They were required to detect a, a irregularity in the stimulus rhythm, and we correlated past performance with this RSR, and we found a correlation during the, the sound with the RSR during the sound, but not uh, in the silent bit. So for, for this study, we focused on the, the sensor level, where we found these, these entrainment echoes. In a, in a new study, we focus on the on the source level, and I'll show you very briefly some preliminary results. Because what we find is that these entrainment echoes are driven by activity in the cerebellum, which is quite interesting uh, when we consider what patients with a lesion in the cerebellum cannot do, and they struggle mostly with tasks that relate to auditory time. We also looked at connectivity, and what we found is that during the silent bit, uh, the regions in the cerebellum, the CRAS, CRAS2, drives activity specifically in uh, inferior frontal drivers. So this brings us even closer to specificity because we can say that we find, uh, we find entrainment echoes only after intelligible speech and they are present, they come from the cerebellum. So as I, as I said, we, we have a similar problem uh, during TACS, because if we find a, a phasic effect here, we don't know is that a true oscillation or is it a reflection of the periodicity of the current. So we ran a very similar study here, where we had one condition, we called it ongoing TACS, that we presented uh, a speech target in noise and participants had to type in what they heard. And we presented that during, we presented it during different TACS phases in each trial. Um, so this condition is similar to what I showed you before, but we had another condition where we stopped TACS immediately before the target presentation. So if we entrain an endogenous oscillation, then the, the, the effect should, the entrained oscillation should continue a little bit after TACS and then lead to a phasic modulation of speech perception, even in that condition where we stopped the, the TACS. So we, we quantified this uh, similar, in a similar way uh, as in the previous studies. We have uh, accuracy as a function of the TACS phase. And here you can see four example subjects. So what we typically do is we, we fit a sign function to the data from individual subjects. And what you can, this, this sign fit has two different parameters. It has a phase, which shows us, uh, which gives us the best phase for individual participants. And these, in this case, as in the other studies, are uniformly distributed. So there's no specific uh, best phase that works for everyone. Oops. But we also have an amplitude of the fit. And this amplitude gives us the magnitude of the phasic modulation. And I'll show you this, these amplitude values now. So what, what we found is that in the pre-target condition where we stopped TACS, we have a phasic modulation of accuracy, but it increases with the duration of TACS that precedes the target presentation, precisely 
as we would extract from an entrained oscillation, it needs a bit of time to entrain to the rhythm series. And this effect is reliable after five seconds of TACS. But we don't we do not see the same pattern in the other condition when I represent the target during TACS. So this, this shows us that um, we can we can entrain uh, endogenous oscillation with TACS because we find entrainment echoes in speech perception after the, the stimulation. So this is the, the final entrainment echo study that I'd, I'd like to show. Uh, again, it, it follows a similar idea, but this is now a study, a psychophysics study, where we tested for echoes in auditory perception. We used uh, a pure tone that was rhythmically amplitude uh, modulated in amplitude at a certain rate, and that pure tone had a certain sound frequency. We assumed that this uh, AM pure tone will induce an oscillation and an echo afterwards. So how can we how can we test for this echo? We just need to present a target, and that was uh, another pure tone that was presented at various days after the entrainer and had also a certain sound frequency. So if there's an echo, then the detection of this target should depend on the rhythm of the preceding entrainer. We also tested another hypothesis that was inspired by studies by Peter Lakatosh and colleagues. In their work, they, they recorded in, in auditory regions of non-human primates that often have a, a preferred sound frequency. So for instance, this region likes uh, a stimulus at, at 16 kilohertz. So what they find is that um, this region entrains to sequences of tones, but it entrains the high, high excitability phase to these tones only for, for tones with a frequency that corresponds to their preferred frequency. If they present other tones, then the region also entrains, but it entrains to the opposite low excitability phase. And we wanted to see if we can find such an effect in humans. What, what does that mean for our study in humans? It means that our sensitivity to a certain, to the sound frequency of the entrainer should fluctuate in phase with the entrainer. And how can we how can we measure this? We can just present a pure tone that has the same sub frequency. And I'll show you how this sounds like. It's really a simple paradigm, and participants have to detect that final final target. So if this tonotopic entrainment idea is, is correct, then if the target has the same sub frequency as the entrainer, then detection should be best in phase with the entrainer and perception should be versed in antiphase with the entrainer. So if, if we take the, the difference between peak and trough performance, then this should be positive. However, if we now present a target that has a different frequency from the entrainer, then we should find precisely the opposite. Perception should be best in antiphase with the entrainer, and we would expect a negative peak trough difference. And finally, if we present targets at the zero crossings of this rhythm, then we should find a, a difference in performance that is close to zero. And I'll show you results for, for several experiments. Um, in the first experiment, we only had this condition where the, the two sound frequencies are different. And remember, this is where we expect a negative uh, peak trough difference. Here we test it if there's a preferred rate of the entrainer to induce entrainment echoes in perception. So we tested these five, five different frequencies here. And indeed, we found such a negative difference, but only after a six hertz entrainer. And we did not find that for, for target presented at the zero crossings of the rhythm. And this, as I said, uh, reflects uh, a rhythmic changes in perception that are in antiphase with the rhythm of the entrainer he showed as dashed lines. So next, we, we wanted to know, can we find some effects for a condition where the, the two sound frequencies are the same? And interestingly, in that second experiment, we, we found precisely the opposite. We find an in-phase echo for a condition where the two have different sound frequencies. We found an anti-phase echo where the two are the same. So we, we were a bit puzzled by that. And we thought, what, what's the difference between the two experiments? 
The one difference is that in the first experiment, the rate of the entrainer varied from trial to trial. In this second experiment, it was fixed to six hertz and did not vary across trials. So we said, okay, if that's the reason, then we should be able to run another experiment that we vary, vary again the rate and should reverse the finding again. So we began varying the rate, but this time around six hertz because that was the optimal rate. And we found that in, in this case, there's again an in-phase uh, echo for the, for the same condition here, precisely as we would expect it from this tonotopic entrainment. So to conclude here, we find the tonotopic entrainment echoes around six to eight hertz, but they are more complex than the entrainment theory predicts. And I'll, I can I can provide an uh, a tentative, tentative explanation of what is difference later. What is also interesting here is that we found echoes between six and eight thirds, and uh, when we look at, at the dominant rate of speech, this is this is quite close to where we find where we find dominant rates of speech. So this might be might be evidence that our system is tuned to process auditory rates that are close to these uh, these frequencies. If I have uh, two minutes left, I can finish at least. Okay. Too fast. <laughs> Just try. So I'll finish with a, a study that is not strictly related to the question of causality, but related to the to all of the studies I've just shown you. Um, so I, I haven't talked much about uh, participants' tasks in, in this study. What we what we did in almost all of the studies is we, we asked them to detect an irregularity in this rhythm. So I'll show you some examples. This was a rhythmic kind of intelligent stimulus. So we, we shifted, sometimes we shifted one of these words to another. So it sounded like this. And participants just had to decide was that regular or irregular. For completeness, this is how one channel speech sounds like. So in the in the FMI study that I showed you at, at the beginning, we found that um, participants are more sensitive to these irregularities if speech is intelligible. And uh, so we found this interesting and ran some follow-up studies uh, online. And we first replicated this effect with more participants. So as you can see, the participants are better at the task of 16 than for one channel speech. However, uh, 16 channel speech is also spectrally more complex than one channel speech. You can see that here, where there's a lot going on here, where, whereas here for one channel speech, all the frequency bands are in sync. So we wanted to know, is this an effect of intelligibility or an effect of spectral complexity? And, so, and decide, and, and constructed another stimulus that is as spectrally com complex as 16 channel speech, but not intelligible by spectrally rotating the 16 channel stimulus. And it sounds like this. You can still perceive it as speech, but it's quite hard to understand. So then we, we just uh, repeated the, the experiment with this 16 channel rotated speech. And we found that again, uh, performance is worse than for a 16 channel speech, which shows us that it's not an effect of uh, spectral complexity, there is a role of intelligibility. So we went even one step further by contrasting uh, two conditions with exactly the same stimulus, but in one participants can understand the stimulus and in the other they cannot. So we used the uh, sine wave speech, which is an interesting stimulus because there's a very strong component of learning. If we don't know what it is, then we very rarely perceive it as speech, but once we know, then we, we basically understand it uh, very well. And I'll show you how this sounds like. They might have understood because it's the same video, because it's the same person as the, as the other. Get ready. So if I tell you that this is pick a blue cow up, then you might understand. Blue 
And that was the same with the, with the shift. So the idea here is that if intelligibility is the, is the reason of why we can do the task better, then participants that have been trained to perceive the stimulus as speech should do better than other participants that are still naive. So we, we had two different participant groups and the, they, were, they were all trained at different times throughout the experiment. And I'll show you, I'll show you how performance changes uh, during the experiment. So these are three experimental blocks. In the first uh, group, after the training, uh, here in blue, participants indeed become better at the task, but they also become better after between the first and the second block, which means that there's also an effect of, of, uh, of time, of, uh, of practice. So this is why we needed the second group that was, that was trained not after the second, but after the first block. And here, what we can see is they don't get much better after the second uh, block, whereas the first group that was trained at that time uh, improved their performance. Also, after the first, when this group was trained, they incre increased in performance more than the, the first group that was not trained at this point in time. So that shows us that in addition to these practice effects, there are also an effect of, of training to perceive sign wave speech as speech. And the, the, the last group, which was trained before they even started the, the task, they are even, even better than, than both of these groups. So this shows us that the intelligibility enhances our perception of timing, even when we control for, for other confounders. So to conclude, previously, what we could say is that when we stimulate rhythmically, then this causally modulates uh, auditory and speech perception. <laughs> but I think now we can go one step further and claim that entrained oscillations causally modulate uh, these perceptual functions. This works only at certain frequencies, and I think that this is meaningful. And uh, it also works with TACS, where we can also uh, entrain endogenous oscillations. The, the first part of the talk um, is based on, on data and an experiment that was that was uh, led by Sander van Bray, who is now in, in Glasgow. The second part was, was driven mostly by Sylvain Lermit uh, at the CERCO in Toulouse, where this work will continue in form of the auditory oscillation group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benedict, for the inspiring presentation. Um, what should we do this? Should we start with questions in the room, maybe, today? That's also that's clapping. That's clapping. Yeah, online uh, participants, please uh, uh, either give a graphical sign uh, if you have a question uh, in the form, for instance, of a raised hand in, uh, in the Zoom software or even post the question in the chat, if that's also possible technically. And since I don't see any raised hands at the moment, why don't we just start with questions in the room? I think Helmut, your hand was first and then it was you, I think. No, you don't have a question? Okay. But Tim, you have a question? Behind you also. Okay, so sorry, yes, we, okay, I don't know. Helmut, uh, Tim and Julia, that's the order I saw. Forgive me if it's wrong. Yeah, thank you very much. Extremely nice um, talk. It's a great uh, experience. Um, excuse my attentional leg has an effect. Sitting in the first row is always very polite to the attention. And I'm coming back to intention. Um, you're talking about entrainment neural or entrained neural oscillations causally modulate something. And of course, not your, uh, oscillations are just a phenomenon of measurement. I mean, it's just like something. It doesn't really mean anything. So the reason why you have this in training of these oscillations to do it is most potentially attention. So we have basically attentional arrhythmic attentional change within our brains. And that means that we have it. Is that did you look into people who have a say pathologically changed attentional um space and would thereby probably have different prefer preferred frequencies. Yeah, so 
I think I, I completely agree that this, I, I would even say that uh, attention and these rhythmic fluctuations, they might be one and the same thing, but one is the neural phenomenon and one is the, the function. Um, I could also see it as, as rhythmic changes in, in, in priorities. Like sometimes we prioritize the, the incoming information, and sometimes we prioritize something else, internal processes. So um, yes, I, I agree that uh, we could we could look at different uh, populations that, that struggle with attention functions. Um, um, there are papers showing that entrainment is different in these populations. I'm not aware of studies that use manipulations to change entrainment. Um, but of course, this is this is something we would like to do in the, in in the near future. Sorry to, to just have a follow up question because you showed in the last the behavioral um, uh, results were basically that as soon as it becomes meaningful, it's better with your sensitivity is better, which also is an intentional phenomenon, I suppose. So that would be the first thought that if you have people who are either able to be trained to that or even are unable to comprehend speech for other reasons, say for aphasia or whatever. So you have, uh, has anyone looked into that or uh, you using these entrainment uh, experiments and then looking into populations in whom speech is not easily um, comprehensible for? Yes, yes. Yeah, there, there are some studies showing that entrainment is changed in hearing impaired listeners, for example. Um, there's a study by, by Molly Henry showing that um, showing that in elderly people. Aphasia, I, I'm not sure, but uh, it might be, you know. There's it's a, a paper that has it in the title, but it's something different, I think. It's like an offline thing with, so Julius Friedrichson has done one of those studies on that, where you could build a bridge for prosody, I think, in patients, but it's not directly there. Yes. But the, the field is quite recent, so I think it is all just starting. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, very exciting work. And thanks for the presentation. I, I, maybe my, my question goes like similar directions. So I wonder now, like, uh, do you have any idea what those entrainment echoes now reflect? So is, is it rather a reverberating signal trace that keeps on oscillating? Uh, or is it rather a prediction that yeah. uh, it, which might go like, in, like along those lines of attention then try to predict the next upcoming signal? Or in other words, is it a top, uh, is it is it a P forward signal that keeps generating yeah. or top down yeah. signal like feedback? Yeah, that, that's exactly the question we want to answer. And that's why I'm also quite excited about these uh, findings from the cerebellum. Um, where other work has shown that the cerebellum might generate predictions of, of upcoming sounds. And um, I think it's also meaningful that it's coupled with the IFG, who, who we also think is uh, it's related to predictions during speech processing. So I, th I think there's, there's something going on that uh, might be related to, a, to either prediction error or a predictions that continue to be upheld. Yeah. So is it possible to, to break the entrainment echo by a prediction after the offset of the stimulus? Yes, that's that's what we also wanted. So I mean so in this in this auditory in this perceptual echo study, the target was not predictable. So it could occur in phase or in antiphase. So in that case the echo is not really useful, right? Because it could harm or it can improve your perception. But in this case, we could still find it. Um, there's work, I think, from Asaf Treska in the visual domain, who also has a, has a rhythmic stimulus. And then participants know that the target will occur in antiphase. And, and they run they wanted to know if the advantage of the in-phase disappears. And, and I think they have mixed results. I think that 
being phased, there, there seems to be a kind of automatic process that biases your perception to the in phase moment, but also but also the anti phase uh, uh, target um, was at some point easier to detect. But I have to look into into that. But that's exactly a question we want to also answer. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm really impressed and I'm also very excited because we just recently submitted a paper on rhythmic and trained and temporal prediction, like the three people in this room. So I found your research very inspiring and exciting. I have a couple of particular questions. Like in your, um, I think it was second uh, TCS study with the words uh, where you had like uh, uh, Unihemispheric stimulation and bihemispheric in the unique condition, which side was that, left or right? Left. And then you didn't see any uh, modulations, right? We, we found a, a bold response modulation, but not a perception modulation. Not a perception. And did, uh, okay, so on the left, you didn't find anything, and the stimuli were words, and uh, yes. did they contain any prosthetic modulation? No. No, no it was. There was no, there was no meaning of the the words together. It was isolated words. Okay, yeah, that's interesting because, uh huh. And you said in the when you found the effect, it was inhibitory, right? We were able to disrupt perception, but not enhance okay. it. But not when you just uh, stimulate just the left hemisphere. Yes, but that finding it would also be related to. Uh, as um, having a basically competing auditory rhythm to the TACS. And that rhythm was quite uh, supra threshold. Mm -hmm. So it might be that entrainment was already at its maximum. And then we can only disrupt it, but we cannot enhance it. We, ha we had another study, um, the TACS echo study. There, I, I didn't show the result, but there we only presented a single target word. And there we were able to enhance perception. So mm -hmm. we don't quite understand yet in which case we can enhance and in which case we can disrupt. There was a different protocol with the type of bursts. It, I don't I know nothing about TCS. It was uh, this one. This one. So here we have a single target word and not a rhythmic sequence. Mm -hmm. And here we were able to. There are some there were some phases of TACS where we improved the accuracy. And this was also bilateral? Yes, that, that was the same same configuration. And by bilateral you mean simultaneous yes. stimulation. Yes. Yes, interesting. Yeah, because I would expect that on the left it's more like word processing, on the right maybe rhythmic prosodic processing and but maybe it makes sense that you couldn't, uh, like, you know, dampen it if you just stimulate the left one because maybe the treatment was too strong that you could enhance yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and another maybe um, technical question, like in the Van Brie study first part, uh, where you looked at this rhythmic echo, but you had like in trade and then sustained interval. I noticed, if I understood this correctly, that on your plots you started the sustained interval 500 milliseconds after the stimuli offset. Was there a reason why you picked that gap? In the, in the TACS or the MEG? In the MEG, in the first part. Yes, yeah. there was a reason, and the reason... Yeah, yeah. here you see that gets zero. Yes, um, there, there was a, a reason, there several reasons. The first is that uh, the phase here is calculated in a, in a time window, mm -hmm. and the time window is one second long. And the, the time here is, I think, the center of the time window, um, which means that it's actually not a single time point, but a, a window that is around the time point. Ah, OK. So it's like a moving window? Yes, yes, yes. It's like wavelength? It's a, just an FFT. OK. And uh, the second reason is that we wanted to wait until the response to the omission, the, the omission of the stimulus disappeared. It's like an evoked response that is caused by the omission. Ah, uh, okay. So, so 
the last uh, like stimulus offset of, uh, would be at zero, right? At zero, they know that there is an omission. Before zero, they don't know. And when was the last like sound played? At uh, zero point five. At zero point five for two hertz and at zero point three three uh -huh. for the three hertz. Because you have an interesting, like, there's some activation you see after zero, like this yes, yeah, red. Yes. So yeah, that's, I think that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the mission response, I think. And that's precisely, oops, sorry. that's precisely where we have, why we have this index. Because we, this omission response is generic, it's not specific to the stimulation rate. So by subtracting the two from each other, we remove this generic response that we can also see in the spectral domain. So everything that remains is only present for, for one of the two stimulations. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, couldn't the emission response itself by being influenced by entrained oscillations, you know, that it yeah. continues and like you're yeah. in the uh, same phase and like uh, that's one of the hypotheses how it would yeah. work, that yeah. you're still continuing this for one cycle and then you have the emission response because your oscillations kind of uh, influence temporal predictions yeah. of that. Yes, yeah. they, I mean, it could be the same thing. We could have a rhythmic omission response that reflects the, I don't know, predict that is the prediction error or just reflects the expectation. Yeah, yeah. and then the, these oscillations that you get a train to could be the underlying you know, neural mechanism for this prediction. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's interesting. Thank you very much. I have. We'll discuss later. But you later, right? Okay. Okay. Emmett had another question. Yeah, uh, just um, uh, regarding maybe I misunderstood something because I didn't understand a single of your um, stimuli, even the ones which are which were supposed to be understood. Um, so they are single words, random words. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was just wondering because um, it's always nice if everything is the same across the languages of the world, but other, on the other hand, they are not uh, the same, and they have very different rhythmic classes. And I would expect that, depending on the rhythmic class which you originate from, it would be quite different how you react to this, at least for a stress pattern language like yeah. German or English. I yeah. think you know, it's not French. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be very, very weird to have this kind of even for enumerations, people would never ever do that like that. Yeah. And so uh, just the question that maybe if it's really a very new experiment, you haven't done it, have thought of it to look at people with different from yeah. different rhythmic classes to see whether they show a difference in the intentional dating. Yeah, no, we, we haven't done it, but it's it's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the advantage we have is that we have only one single one yeah. syllable words. So um, so it is just like a word. It's like cow, whatever. They are completely meaning this as a it's a it's, it's a like pool of five hundred okay. monosyllabic words, and we just choose randomly. But I I agree that this is an interesting question. It somehow rings a bell, in the sense that someone might have. Uh, I have to look for it. Maybe there's a study that focuses on that. That's it. I'm wondering, Harley Keen, if you wrote a you similar question about this in the chat, is it answered already by, by this answer? I think Harley Keen has already left it. Oh no, still is there. Because the question is intelligibility and entrainment is dependent on the known language, and the training response would indicate that perhaps. So that's kind of a similar similar question. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't think. I mean, Amit Kuzan has done, but that's a single language and it's super segmental rhythm, I think. But you bought it easy to do, that's why. So yeah. if you're in France now. Yeah, yeah if you're in France, that should be They're crazy. crazy. Yeah. I have another question here in the chat, which is um, in some papers, it is discussed that it's not a criterion for entrainment of endogenous rhythms to outlast the stimulation duration. Mm -hmm. But you comment on whether you think this happens in all cases and for different modalities, for instance, visual and train. Yeah, I, I agree uh, completely that uh, the echo is a sufficient but not necessary criterion. So it could be that we have an oscillation that stops very quickly. And um, that's, um, that's actually what we expected in the auditory domain. 
because in the auditory domain, uh, everything changes much, much more quickly than in the visual domain. So if I were an auditory system, if something stops, I would have the, the need to, to stop my, my echo quickly. So um, yeah, we actually, we actually now running a study where we test of um, whether making this echo meaningful for, for a task will make it longer. So um, I hope to, to answer that soon. Um, but I agree that you do not have to see an echo for it to be an oscillation. Um, do you think because I mean, you will probably discuss that later today with someone from the group, but do you think that we will ever be able to associate the classical work and it's from the 70s or minted stimuli and MMM studies and like the rapid presentation rates, you always get these kind of effects on the omitted stimulus. You get like pre-stimulus alpha phase locking, you get all sorts of things. And can we ever dissociate that from this single cycle that most people see when they make these types of, of experimental paradigms. Where you study like the interval afterwards, after the zero, you remove the spectral leakage like you do, and then you see this response spectrally. Can we ever dissociate that from the omitted stimulus response? It's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. I don't have to answer it now, but because it breaks my, my mind. If you have a solution, then no, I don't. <laughs> but I, I like to be fascinated and, and believe that this is actually how it works. And maybe it's both, but it's kind of, you know, scientifically, I would really like to. Anyway, but we talk about that. One question that I had is about intelligibility. And um, you found in some of your studies that the simulation effects they only seem to occur for the intelligible stimuli, right? So that's um, why I'm wondering what aspect of speech processing or speech perception you are interfering with. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it means it must be some kind of top-down thing, right? So it must be related to some kind of internal representation. Now, on which level is that representation? Is it for logical system, is it ten? No, yeah, but if it would be attention, you would get it for unintelligible speech. Mm -hmm. so it's you can also, interest. it's more interesting. You know, My, but, yeah. if you're yeah, if you're if you're thinking about language acquisition or something, the baby would always turn its head to linguistic. Is that for adults too, or is it right. class another yeah. way? Yeah. That's kind of that's kind of something. Where I struggled with, right? Like, on which level are you actually interfering with the with the, mm -hmm. with the process? And would there be ways to to find out about that? Say, based on spatial location of the stimulation site, mm -hmm. uh, based on the specific evoked response that you modulate. Uh, you know, these are just like wild thoughts, but I think you you, you know what I'm yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah. So with TACS, it's complicated because the, the spatial resolution is not high enough. Mm. If we stimulate, then we stimulate everything. Um, so I don't know if it has to be topped out. It could also be um, like a level that extracts features of the sound that are specific to speech. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be super high level features, it can be a co-modulation of frequencies that define in speech. Um, so and how was the unintelligible stimuli constructed? Was that speech with some noise? That was a uh, noise recording. So you can see the spec. You can see it here. Oh, it was this one. So, um, so, so what you do is you 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 take the original speech and then you filter it in, in n frequency bands, and n is the number of channels. And uh, for the noise, you just take a single frequency band, and then you extract the envelope and you impose it onto noise. And so the the more bands you need, the higher is the, the 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 more resolution you have basically. 
The more details you have, yeah. Um, yeah. You could probably think about varying the stimulus dimensions of the target in terms of their similarity to the preceding context, so something like a priming paradigm. And, um, you know, I, I always think that like, you have to ask yourself what Friedemann Pulverman does. Because that's what he would, he would like take a priming effect or something and take, like, say, semantic manipulation, a phonological feature manipulation, a manipulation of anything, like you say, frequency, and see whether your effect that you're getting, the context effect, is specific to one of these domains, and then you know what you tapped into. Yep. Because intelligibility is a broad thing, right? It just means like you can somehow understand what it's in this, you know, but what it really was the reason for that. Yeah, we don't. You know, no, and in that way, you could would be a very yeah. complex experiment. Yeah. But, but that's also the reason why we why we designed this one. Yeah, right? when we have sine yeah. wave speech, yeah. uh, we just need to move it to the TACS side. Just <laughs> okay. One more question from the chat. Uh, Harley Keen is asking, um, why not monitor the stimulus response in the optimal band of four to eight hertz instead? In the entrainer frequency response, I notice stimulus peak in the second harmonic of the three hertz. Perhaps harmonic response should also be attempted. So that's two questions, I think. The first one is about the response in the optimal band. No. Um, so the optimal band meaning. Harley Keen, do you hear us? Maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, good morning, good morning, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm in the States here, so it's, it's early morning for me. Um, <clears throat> so I noticed in your frequency response chart there that then uh, when you when you subjected your entrainment to the three hertz uh, response, there was a, a big peak in the six hertz uh, as well, which would uh, forget it was the the very first slide we showed on the frequency response. Yeah, right there. So, on the three hertz stimulus, if you notice, there's a big peak in the six hertz. That would imply a harmonic response. Yes, you're there. Yeah, um, and it seems like it the entrainment wants to optimize for the six to eight hertz bands where intelligibility is. I, I guess most optimal in the uh, language response chart that you showed later on or earlier. I forget exactly which which slide that was, but um, perhaps a response the response would be a bit more uh, predictable in the in that band. I would say. Um. In the uh, in this six to eight hertz band, because it seems like that's that's where. So, so, that's... so you mean we could look at the echo in the six to hertz band in this time? Yes. Here? Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Idea. we didn't. Yeah. Didn't do... yeah. Because it, from like I'm I'm seeing it here it, from the three hertz response directly into the six, and it seems like there's a there's a spike there, which it from a signal perspective alone that's that seems like a harmonic response. In the echo, yeah, 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 that's a, that's, a, that's a good idea. So far, I I ignored the harmonic because it can also be produced by an imperfect sine wave. So it could be that there's a three hertz response and it's not completely sinusoidal, and then we see this harmonic. But you're right that it could also be that we additionally entrain these at these more optimal rates rates that we found in the other study, and then we yeah we can look at the echo at that frequency here. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, in the interest of time as well, and I think there's more opportunity for in the afternoon to meet with Benedict. There's opportunity tonight to hang out. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Benedict again for Oscar. Thank you. Thank you. Online as well uh, for their contributions and yeah. see you around at the language circle. Spread the word.